Let me, uh, let me pray for us, and then we are going to enter our time together. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have provided us to come together and, and learn more about you. And um, God, I pray today that you would use me and you would speak through me and that we would not hear uh, from Jacob, but that we would hear from the most holy God. And so God, I pray that you will challenge us through uh, what you prepared us for. And uh, God, just um, I pray that you're glorified through um, what we studied today. It's in Jesus' name we ask all this. Amen. Hey, I want you to take a look at a quick video and then we'll get, get started together. We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there, now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together. All right, well, we are entering the time of year for our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and so um, it's kind of funny when I was preparing to, to preach uh, this message, which I knew about six weeks ago I'd be preaching this Sunday. Um, I was thinking about it, and when we started our Annie Armstrong Easter offering time, I preached the Sunday before that started, and so I'm preaching the Sunday before uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering starts. And so uh, if you have a Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, uh, turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. We're going to uh, be there for a while before we uh, really get to it, so um, get comfortable. We'll, we'll read that a little bit later, okay? So um, we're going to talk first about Lottie Moon, and then we'll read, read Revelation 7, 9 through 10 later on. Um, and so uh, we'll, be, we'll be there for a while, um, and while, while we uh, think about what those verses mean, I'm going to use the story of someone's life to illustrate what this person knew to be true about God's desire for the nations and what these two verses mean, among others, for the church. And so today we're going to look at the life of the woman that this offering that we take up in December is named after. Um, we're going to answer this question, who is Lottie Moon? Um, because some of us may not know who she is. And we're going to discover God's desire for the nations and what that has to do with us. So, off we go. You'll see the picture on the screen. That is Lottie Moon. Um, the harvest is great and the laborers oh so few. Why does the Southern Baptist Church lag behind in this great work? These were the words of Lottie Moon on November 1st, 1873. Twenty-four years prior, the Foreign Mission Board had established a policy that no single woman could serve as a missionary. But Lottie believed that every person, regardless of gender, and every church, regardless of size or resources, had a part to play in reaching every nation. This year marks the 101st anniversary of the Southern Baptist Convention's official acknowledgement of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We have raised as Southern Baptist uh, billions of dollars in honor of this woman. Um, why, but why do we take up this offering each year in honor of her? And what is this offering for? So, so to understand that, we need to understand Lottie Moon. December 12, 1840... This is the day that Char Charlotte Diggs Moon was born in Virginia, and before long, Charlotte picked up the nickname of Lottie. Um, her family was thoroughly Baptist and financially wealthy, giving her access to education that other girls did not have. She attended the Virginia Female Seminary at the age of 14, and then a female institute at 17, becoming proficient in Greek, Latin, Italian, French, and Spanish, taking up Hebrew as well. By the time she finished school, Jim Broadus called her the most educated woman in the South. Um, but while her mind was strong, her heart was sinful. When she was 18, there was a series of evangelistic meetings at the church near her school. Lottie was not interested in going, but her friends prayed specifically for her by name 
until one night she decided to attend those meetings in order to mock what was happening. Do not discount praying for your friends who don't know Jesus by name. That night, December 21st, 1858, Lottie Moon was born again. Her zeal for God grew, as did her desire to teach, so she moved to Danville, Kentucky, where she taught, where, where she taught at a girls' school. While there, she met G.W. Burton and A.B. Cabanis, former Southern Baptist missionaries to China. By the time she moved to Cartersville, Georgia, to start a girls' school, she was giving money regularly to the, to the foreign mission board. But Lottie never thought of going as a missionary herself. One of her biographers, Catherine Allen, wrote, Most Baptists did not think that God called women to anything. Preachers wouldn't have even thought to direct a mission call to women in their audience, except as they might ride along with their husbands. This soon began to change in 1872 when a women's mission organization started in Baltimore and then eventually spread to different states. Um, Through this, uh, women began raising funds for missions that flowed directly to the Foreign Mission Board, and with those funds came influence. The president of the Foreign Mission Board at the time, which is now the International Mission Board, began sending single women as missionaries overseas. This was due to a simple case that had risen. Uh, A couple was planning to go overseas and wanted the wife's sister, who was single, to come along with them. And as soon as the board approved this case, a single woman uh, from the Moon family appealed to go as well. But it was not Lottie. It was her sister, Edmonia. She said, if you're sending single women, sign me up. And on uh, April 9th of 1872, Edmonia Moon became a Southern Baptist foreign missionary. And two months later, she was in China. It didn't take long for Edmonia to appeal to Lottie to join her. She wrote, you are doing a noble work at home, but are there not some who could fill your place there? I don't know of anyone who could fill the place offered to you here. With the seeds planted in her heart, in February of 1873, Lottie heard a sermon from her missions-minded pastor who pleaded for more laborers to go. And so Lottie spent the afternoon praying and would later say that day that God's word through her pastor cemented her determination to go to China. Coincidentally, Anna Safford, Lottie's Presbyterian friend and fellow teacher, sensed the same call. The girls told, uh, they told the girls and families at their school that they would be leaving to become missionaries. Many people who heard this remarked that it was a waste of such excellent women on the uncaring heathen. Why go to China when these good southern girls in Georgia needed an education so desperately? However, steadfast in the face of discouragement, Lottie was officially appointed as a missionary in July of 1873, leaving the United States in September of 1873 at the age of 32. After a brief stop in Japan... Lottie finally landed in China, which would be her home for the next 39 years. There was much work to be done, and this allowed a great opportunity for Lottie. Before long, Lottie was traveling with other missionaries to villages to share the gospel. They would ride into town and were immediately greeted by curious onlookers. A crowd then drawn, they would share the gospel, teach songs, and they would answer questions. In this setting, Lottie's fiery personality would come out. It was not uncommon for people to call Westerners foreign devils. And Lottie was patient with the adults who spoke this way, but she would not tolerate this speech among children. One day, some boys surrounded her on the street, ridiculing her and calling her names. In response, she stood up to her four-foot, three-inch height and gave them a stern lecture and told them that they had no manners. They were dumbfounded, with mouths shut, They sat down around her, and 30 minutes later, those same boys who berated her were chanting the catechism and singing the hymn, Happy Land, with her. Slowly, Lottie began falling more and more in love with the place and people that she knew in China. She would spend her days traveling from village to village. At one point, she covered 44 villages in 11 days. She was hooked. She had had found her life's work in China. She, She labored in this way for three years until her sister, Edmonia, became sick, needing to go back to the U.S. And so, in 1876, Lottie escorted her back to Virginia. However, she was, she was restless to get back to the field as soon as she could. Her ministry was hard work, which is why she was unhappy when she read that the biblical recorder back home had announced that the days of missionary hardship were over. She wrote to them saying, and this is all you need to know about Lottie Moon, I am always ashamed to dwell on physical hardships, but this time I have departed from my usual restraint because I know that there are some 
who in their pleasant homes in America, without any real knowledge of the facts, declare that the days of missionary hardships are over. To speak in the open air in a foreign tongue from six to eleven times a day is no trifle. The fatigue of travel is something. The ends are simply the acme of discomfort. If anyone fancying, fancies sleeping on brick beds in rooms with dirt floors and walls blackened by the smoke of many generations, the yard also being the stable yard and the stable itself being within three feet of your door, I wish to declare most emphatically that as a matter of taste, I differ. If anyone thinks that he would like, to, uh, like the constant contact with the, the great unwashed, I must still say from experience, I find it unpleasant. If anyone thinks that the constant risk of exposure to smallpox and other contagious disease against which the Chinese take no precaution whatsoever is just the, mo- the most charming thing in life, I shall continue to differ. In a word, let him try it. A few days of roughing it, as we ladies do habitually, will convince even the most skeptical. Indeed, the, these, these hardships took a toll on many people. Uh, by 1877, of the eight new missionaries who came after Lottie, three were dead, three had breakdowns and left the field, and one had resigned over doctrinal issues. Thus, more, more reinforcements were needed, and this troubled Lottie. Why, she asked, did one million Southern Baptists only have one man and three women witnessing to 30 million souls? She wrote, a Christian should should ask himself not if it is his duty to go to the heathen, but if he may dare stay at home. The command is so plain, go. More funds and missionaries were needed to sustain the new growing work in China, and it caused Lottie to write a letter in 1887 that would go down in Southern Baptist history. Uh, She wrote, In a former letter, I called attention to the work of Southern Methodist women, endeavoring to use it as an incentive to stir up the women of our Southern Baptist churches to a greater zeal in the cause of missions. Southern Methodist women in one year have contributed to missions, clear of all expenses, nearly $65,000. Doesn't this put us Baptist women to shame? And I am convinced that one of the chief reasons our Southern Baptist women do so little is the lack of organization. Why should we not learn from these noble Methodist women and instead of the paltry offerings we make, do something that will prove that we are really in earnest in claiming to be followers of him who, though he was rich for our sake, became poor? Lottie suggested that Southern Baptists spend a week of prayer together for global missions, followed by an offering to be gathered at Christmas. She said the most appropriate time to consecrate a portion from abounding riches and scant poverty to send forth the good tidings of great joy into all the earth. And so if you received a bulletin today... Um, you'll notice that this was in it. And this is the National Week of Prayer among Southern Baptists for International Missions. And it starts on December 1st. And this is exactly what Lottie was talking about. And so she, want, she desired that we would join together and pray for international missions for that week and then take up a Christmas offering. Um, and so the following year, after this letter, the Women's Missionary Union, or WMU, was founded and raised enough money to send three women to help Lottie. When these women were on their way to meet her, Lottie wrote, Please say to the new missionaries that they are coming to a life of hardship, responsibility, and constant self-denial. They must live the greater part of the time in Chinese houses in close contact with the people. They will be alone in the interior and will need to be strong and courageous. If the joy of the Lord be their strength, the blessedness of the work will more than compensate for its hardships. Let them come rejoicing to suffer for the sake of the Lord and Master who freely gave his life for them. Suffering was definitely increasing, and persecution was becoming a greater problem. When, when newly converted Christians uh, stopped worshiping their ancestral tablets, family members began beating them. At one church, uh, some came running to tell Lottie of the persecution. So Lottie hurried to the scene where she stood in front of the persecutors and boldly declared, If you try to destroy this church, you will have to kill me first. Jesus gave himself to us, or for us as Christians, and I am ready to die for him now. Through hardship, Lottie was thriving in many ways, saying, I have never found mission work more enjoyable. I constantly thank God that he has given me a work that I love so much. But she was struggling in her health. In 1903, at 63 years old, Lottie returned to the States for rest. Those who had known her could see that she was struggling physically and pleaded for her not to go back and and asked her to retire in the United States. To this, Lottie responded, nothing could make me stay here. China is my joy and my delight, and it is my home now. So she returned to Asia. Immediately, she jumped into organizing four-day schools, counseling visitors, teaching classes, and overseeing Sunday schools, 
all in addition to her main work of evangelism in the city and the country. By 1910, she had the privilege of attending an associational meeting of Chinese churches and seeing a room full of second and third generation believers, fruits of her own labor. And at this time, 250 people a year were being baptized in Pingtu, where she worked. Yet amid the reward of her labors, Lottie experienced an increasing loneliness. After more than 35 years on the field, or in the field, Lottie wrote, I pray that no missionary will ever be as lonely as I have been. The year 1911 brought famine to the Chinese and to Lottie. She wrote, how can we bear to sit down at our bountiful tables and know of such, great, or of such things and not bestir ourselves to help? Missionaries not only give their money, but give their lives to help the famine stricken. Hardly ever did I know of a famine that did not claim its victims among missionaries. She pleaded for more funds from Southern Baptists, but she received words that the Foreign Mission Board was in debt and could send nothing. And so Lottie used her own funds to provide relief for uh, those that were starving around her. And at this point, she was struggling physically. She asked another missionary, Dr. Adams, to come and and help her write her will. And when he came uh, to help her write her will, he found a woman who weighed approximately 50 pounds. She was extremely frail. Wondering how she had deteriorated physically so quickly, he learned that Lottie had made a conscious decision not to eat so that her impoverished Chinese neighbors could be fed instead. The missionaries decided that they needed to send Lottie back to the United States, but she had no desire to go, but they insisted that it was the only way she she could recover. And she had no strength to fight them because we know that she would have. Um, And so they carried her aboard a ship, and on that boat ride... Through a long night, she repeated, We are weak, but he is strong. By morning, she could no longer speak, but could only point upward when um, her companion approached her. The ship slowly made its way to uh, a port in Japan, and there on Christmas Eve, Lottie opened her eyes. She smiled silently and looked around her, and then with a great effort, she raised her fists together in the fashion of a fond Chinese greeting, and the next moment, her spirit and body were completely still. On December 24, 1912, in Kobe, Japan, Miss Lottie Moon, age 72, died, and her remains were given back to the Foreign Mission Board. But the Chinese people mourned, and they asked, When will the heavenly book visitor come to us again? How she loved us. In the year that she died, almost 2,500 people were baptized where she had worked. This was the fruit of a woman who had once said, I would, I had a thousand lives that I might give them to China. So, why, Lottie Moon had asked, with so much opportunity to spread the gospel around the world to people who have never heard the name of Jesus, do so few Southern Baptists go to them? Why were Southern Baptists placing limits on the kinds of people who could go? Why were Southern Baptists placing limits on the amount of support they might send? This is why we exist as Southern Baptists. For the sending of missionaries to men, women, and children who have no opportunity to to hear the gospel and know the name of Jesus. We, we participate collectively with other Southern Baptists to accomplish this. And, and we do that partially through this offering that we'll take over the next month. It goes 100% to international missionaries who, who are sharing the gospel with people, who are providing for people who don't know Jesus and have little opportunity to know him like we do each and every day. Lottie Moon had the right idea of God's desire for the nations. And we need to understand it as well. We need to understand our role in God's desire for the world. So Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The focus throughout the Bible, and this passage especially, is salvation. And sometimes we, we just get used to that. Many times I would assume that salvation is, a, is really a pretty churchy word that we think that everybody understands. But in all reality, many in this very room might not understand it. They might not know uh, why, why we need to be saved, what we need saved from, or, or who even saves us if we can't save ourselves. 
Through this passage in Revelation, we will see what salvation is. We'll see who provides salvation, who it's for, and what happens because of salvation that is provided for us. And so, in a very short answer, we can say the, the, source, the source of salvation is God. But I can't, we can't move on from there by just saying that the, the source of salvation is God. Um, first of all, because we need more explanations. Second of all, because I'm a preacher, and we can't just say something and move on. So here we go. Uh, to answer the question about the source of salvation, we need to understand why we even need it. Uh, we are in desperate need of salvation because we have consistently disobeyed God in the way that we live our lives. Our nature is to oppose God from the day that we are born. And because of that opposition, there is a separation between us and God. And so since we have broken, a broken relationship with God because of the things that we have done, the only one who is able to correct that relationship is God himself. He is the source of any hope that we have of spending eternity with him. And he provided salvation. As we see in verse 10 in Revelation 7, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now that brings us to the next point in explaining who this person is besides God who is, in the, who is the source of salvation. We need to talk about the provision of salvation. Salvation belongs to God and to the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who God provided as a sacrifice on our behalf. And you might ask, why, why was he able to provide that when we couldn't do that for ourselves? And why is he called the Lamb? See, when Jesus is called the lamb, it's referring to Jesus as the perfect and ultimate sacrifice for sin. To understand what Jesus did, we have to understand the Old Testament uh, sacrificial system a little bit. Sacrifices in the Old Testament were set up by God to prepare uh, the way for Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice. The sacrifice of, of lambs played an important role in Jewish life. So when John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world... Jewish people likely thought of any number of important sacrifices. They could have thought of Passover lambs that they would sacrifice to remember how God led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. They could have been thinking about daily sacrificial lambs that were sacrificed each morning and each evening for the sins of the people. These sacrifices, though, uh, would all point toward the sacrifice that Jesus would make. The point of Jesus' time would, uh, would have been familiar or the people of Jesus' time, sorry, um, would have been familiar with Isaiah and Jeremiah where they said that uh, one would come and be brought like a lamb led to slaughter. And now the ideas of sacrifices for us is pretty strange, um, and we, do, we don't really understand that concept, but we do understand the concept of paying, for con or paying, for con or paying consequences for something that we have done. We can understand that. We can understand that the wages of sin is death and that our sin separates us from God. We can also understand that the Bible teaches us in Romans that we are all sinners and none of us is righteous before God. And because of our sin, we are separated from God both in this life and for eternity. But we know already that God is the source of salvation. And we see in a couple different places specifically where God made a decision on our behalf. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. In the life of Jesus, which was a life of perfection without sin, he led a life worthy of sacrificing himself on our behalf and providing a way for us to have right relationship with God. In living life as a human, he identified himself with us to experience the same hardships as us, all while never sinning against God, which is something we are unable to do. And because of who he claimed to be, religious leaders at the time decided that the way to get rid of him was to turn him over to Romans who would then crucify Jesus. But that was God's plan. It would take the shedding of blood by a perfect sacrifice to completely cover the sin of all people and make them right with God. You see, in the beginning, when, when Adam committed the very first sin, he created a separation between all of humanity and God for all time. It took one man's sin to separate us from God, but it also took one man's perfect life and death as a sacrifice to provide a bridge over the separation that was created by sin. Through his death on the cross as God's perfect sacrifice for sin and his resurrection three days later, 
we can now have eternal life if we believe that uh, what he has done on our behalf and confess that we need Jesus to save us from our sin. And just like Adam's sin caused a separation from uh, God for all people, we need to see that the object of salvation through Jesus is for all people as well. Look again at verse 9 with me. After this I looked, a great, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne. I could stand here, and I could tell you over and over my ideas about who I believe salvation is for. And I could tell you who I think needs salvation and who I believe God desires to provide salvation for, but that would be pretty much useless. We don't want to know what I have to say about that. We need to know what God says about that. So let's take a quick look through Scripture to see if the desire of God has always been the salvation of all nations or if this is just a New Testament thing. Let's see if this has always been the plan or if this is just some new thing that the American church is pushing. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Exodus nine sixteen. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Second Chronicles chapter six verse thirty three. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. Psalm 22, verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Isaiah 49, verse 6. It is too light a thing that you should be uh, my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And to him he was given dominion and glory in a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Matthew 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Mark 13, verse 10, And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of, our, of God, our Savior, who desires that all people be saved and to, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. 1 John, 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. And Revelation chapter 2. 7 verse 9 after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands who is the object of salvation who is salvation for it's for us and it is for all people and all nations in all languages, all people. For those in the room who have already experienced salvation in Jesus, we praise God for that. But did you know that there are some things that are definite results of salvation? Look at the end of verse 9, end of verse 10 with me. We'll see two things that are results of experiencing salvation. The first thing that we see is that as a result of salvation is in verse 9. Salvation should cause us to worship Jesus. It says that the multitude of people are in front of the throne, clothed in white robes and, and with palm branches in their hands. First, the multitude has on white robes. Now, if you look down a little bit in, uh, to verse 14, it says that they have uh, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, now that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. How in the world can you wash something in blood and it become white? Now we have to understand that white is the color of purity and it's the color of victory. Our robes are dirty. Our lives are dirty from our sin. And through Jesus we can experience victory over that sin. 
So when we place our faith in what Jesus has done on our behalf, we are able to be seen in robes that are white, robes that are pure, and robes that are victorious. But the multitude that John saw also have palm branches. Now in the book, I'm going to show you two different places. Um, They're not on the screen, but in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verse 40, it says, And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and bow of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. In the book of John, chapter 12, verse 13, it says, So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. In both of these instances, the people are worshiping God. And this is a result of the salvation that is provided by God. God has provided salvation for the people of Israel by by bringing them out of Egypt. And and they worshipped him for that. Jesus was approaching Jerusalem as the crowd brought out palm branches to worship him because of the salvation that he promised that he was about to bring. Experiencing salvation from God deserves and requires our worship. But not only does it require worship, but salvation requires and results in declaration. Verse 10, they cry out with a loud voice that salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. We ought to declare the salvation of God and the, and the salvation that he provides through Jesus to all people around us. Notice here that these people gathered around the throne in heaven are people who are declaring God's salvation, and they're all people who have experienced salvation through Christ. We ought to view them as the church. We should be declaring with a loud voice to other Christians the salvation that God provides. That's why we come together on Sundays. We, we sing songs about God, and, and we sing uh, and, and we preach his salvation uh, so that other believers are reminded of what God has done for them. That's why we gather as a church. But it doesn't stop there. The salvation of a Christian leads not only to declaring God's salvation to other believers, but it requires declaration of God's salvation among those who have yet to trust in Jesus. This is the promise for the future. We see it over and over in verse 9, this promise. God's promise for the future is that all people groups would surround the throne of God in heaven. You have to keep in mind that, that John's vision in the book of Revelation is of the future. So this is God's promise of what is to come. And so the future promise of all people groups in heaven should make us ask a question. How did they get there? The answer is really quite simple. These people groups got there because Christians share the gospel with their neighbors. These people got there because Christians plant churches. These people got there because churches send missionaries who then plant churches around the world. The promise for the future is that Jesus will return to earth. But he will not return until all people groups have the opportunity to know Jesus. So Christians in the room, do you, do you want Jesus to come back in your lifetime? I know, I know that I do. Do you want him to come back? Well, are you worshiping God and declaring his salvation in a way that ensures that Jesus comes back soon? The harvest is great, and the laborers oh so few. Why does the Southern Baptist Church lag behind in this great work? If God desires that all nations experience salvation through him, the goal of every local church And every individual believer must be the spread of the gospel to the nations. If God desires that, it must be our goal as well. Why would our goal not be the same as God's goal? And if that's not our goal as a church, if that's not our goal personally, but we know that it's God's goal, I would ask you whose goal needs to change. Our musicians are going to come today. We're going to set aside a time to respond to whatever the Lord is doing in in our hearts through his word. 
There's just a few things that, that I want us to be challenged with as we enter this time to, to respond. I know, I know that there are some of you in this room who are not followers of Jesus. I know that there are some in the room who are not Christians. I beg you to consider why you're hesitating in following Jesus. It's God's desire that you would place your faith in what Jesus has done on your behalf. And if you haven't done that, I encourage you today that nothing else matters. Nothing in this world matters more than your relationship with Jesus Christ. So I plead with you today, if you are not a follower of Jesus and you've never placed your faith in what he has done for you, you must do that today. You can't let any more time pass. I know it's likely that you don't know what that means. <laughs> That's why we're here. And it's so easy to accept what Jesus has done on your behalf and to call out to him knowing that you need salvation. So if you're not a believer today, I pray that during this time of response, you will come to faith in Jesus. So during that time, we'll be waiting down here for you to walk you through that and lead you through that. But I also know that there are some here who are followers of Jesus that are just too comfortable, myself included. Far too many times I am very comfortable to come here on Sundays and sit in my office throughout the week and have no desire to go out and share the gospel with anyone. And that is far too many of us. We are way too comfortable in just coming here and being in our own little bubble. Myself is included. So if you know that that's you and you need to get uncomfortable, because being uncomfortable with Jesus is a pretty comfortable place to be. You know you need to get uncomfortable Maybe you just need to come forward during this time and just lay that before the Lord. Say, God, I'm too comfortable in, in, in what I've been doing and I, and I need to go and proclaim and declare your salvation to those around me. Maybe that's what you need to do today. And make a commitment that you'll do so. I know I know there are Christians in the room today like myself that need to no longer hold themselves back from the Lord and allow Him to use them in any way and wherever it is that He desires to take you or me. And it may not even be out of Casey. but it is far too often that we are so hesitant and want to hold back from what God really wants to do in and through us. So those in the room who are Christians, I plead with you to give your whole self to God. We're going to sing the song, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. And, and I'm just going to encourage you today if you sing this song, let it be true of you. Don't take this time to sing wherever he leads, I'll go, to only say, except there. Or except to those people. 
If you're not a Christian today, he desires to lead you into his salvation. If you, if you are a Christian, he desires to do so much in and through you if you will just go like this. So those are the ways that we're going to respond today. During this time to respond, reflect on what God desires to do in you this morning. Father, I thank you for this time that you have set aside for us to hear from you. God, I pray that in this time to respond that you will challenge us and convict us. And God, I pray that pray that you will show us your salvation during this time. And show us your power. Father, help us to respond and to take that first step out to follow you and wherever you want. So God, we give you this time. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.